are going to get started in just a minute. Thank you for being here. We're super excited to have Dr. Gaines with us today in our second to last um, Friday Forum series lecture in our fall 2020 um, State of the Democracy series. So thanks for joining us along the way and um, asking really awesome questions and, and hearing from our great speakers. So we're super happy to continue this series. Okay, and it's noon, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so yeah, thank you to our sponsors for making this Friday Forum series possible. We are super grateful um, for the chance to put this together virtually. Um, it has been a crazy year and we are grateful to have come together every Friday at noon and um, talk about it together and, and the most pressing issues facing our democracy today. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Dr. Gaines. Um, so Brian Gaines research deals with all aspects of elections, electoral rules, and public opinion. Um, some of his recent work has dealt with campaign finance fraud, pros and cons of convenience voting, interference from survey experiments, and assessing bias and electoral maps, and has appeared in such outlets as the American Statistician, American Journal of Political Science, Journal of Politics, Political Analysis, this, and State of Politics and Policy Quarterly. He has published op-eds in many newspapers in Illinois, the San Jose Mercury News, and the Wall Street Journal. Um, so we are super grateful to have you here today. And um, with that, the floor is yours. I am going to actually turn my camera off um, and turn it back on again when we're ready for Q&A. Um, just to, as a reminder to our attendees, um, you are right after um, Dr. Gaines' talk, you're welcome to use the Q&A feature and webinar and ask your questions and, and have them answered. So yeah, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. And, um, I think Casey and Michelle were very well organized and invited me weeks and weeks and weeks ago. And, uh, when they invited me, I think the Institute of Government and Public Affairs had just put out uh, a short white paper about the challenges to implementing early voting and uh, I think some focus on Illinois, but uh, maybe we discussed this broadly that the across the whole country, there's gonna be a lot more early voting this year. And uh, one of the things that we discussed in that paper is um, concerns about fraud. And I think, I don't remember if the title for today it emphasizes fraud, I think so. I also can't recall, I think we also had the option, had the option of going before or after the election and I, for better or for worse, I chose to do the last session right before the election. So I'm not explaining uh, what we now know happened. I'm making uh, some forecasts and um, uh, I think I've, I've done this both ways. And in fact, in 2000, I agreed to do a breakfast broadcast about what happened in the presidential election. And then that was a case when by 6 a.m. the day after the election, we didn't know what had happened. I spent most of my broadcast talking about the election of 1876 and um, how we, we didn't know if Bush or Gore had won and how things were resolved uh, way back in 1876. This time, I think, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, why early voting, absentee voting, remote voting um, raises concerns about vote fraud. And then what I'll present, I don't, I'm not going to try to present an entire academic paper. I'll show you a little bit of data that's basically about the subjective side. What do people believe about vote fraud across the country? Where do they think it's, which states do people think it's most prevalent? And um, I'm not going to filibuster and take the whole hour. I think my plan is to talk for about 30 minutes and then I'll be wide open to questions of all kinds. We can emphasize vote fraud. We can talk about particular data, these survey data that about people's beliefs about fraud, or you can go in, off in other directions as you like. So um, I guess the first question is, is uh, what kinds of fraud am I talking about? And I'm, I'm going to be directed by the survey. So um, there, this particular survey is, is called the Survey of Performance of American Elections, and it's been done uh, since 2008, I think. Um, one of the nice features is it's organized by people uh, originally at Caltech and MIT, and it's now housed at MIT. They have a fairly big sample from every state and the District of Columbia, so 200 respondents in each state. And uh, most of the big surveys we have are not uh, designed to overemphasize smaller states, so you get a lot of Californians and a lot of New Yorkers and Floridians and Floridians and uh, so on. And you get not so many people in North Dakota and uh, very few in uh, Montana, the District of Columbia. So it's harder to make comparisons across states. So this is a, a survey designed particularly um, to make it easier to learn about how the states compare. 
And then it's all about election administration and people's experiences with voting. How long did they have to wait in line? Uh, what were the difficulties or were there any difficulties? Um, how confident are they in the vote and so on? So it's a nice source of information about the way people experience the election. Um, it's not the only way to study fraud, of course, but I think it's a useful way. So let me just throw a few figures up to show you, tell you what I'm looking at. Uh, this is uh, one of the items they've had in every issue, every edition of this survey, they'd ask people how confident they are their own vote was counted correctly, and then how confident they are the votes in their state were counted correctly. So these are the distributions for Illinois, and I've got in bright green, people who say very confident. Uh, lighter green is somewhat confident. This, I guess it's yellow, is don't know. I don't know how confident to be. Uh, orange is I'm not too confident that my vote was counted correctly. And then red, it's just a little sliver here, is not at all confident that my vote was counted correctly. So if you look at this little bar plot for Illinois, and to, this is 2016 data, of course, I don't have the 2020 data. It will be out um, pretty quick with less than a year after the election uh, on academic standards pretty quickly, but it's a long time before I can analyze it. Um, if you look at Illinois, it looks pretty good. Uh, more than 60%, uh, it's almost 70% of people say they're very confident their own vote was counted correctly. That's that's good news. There's only a little sliver of red here of people who are, don't feel confident their vote was counted the way they intended it to be counted. Uh, not too confident, it's just something like 7%. Um, the bottom panel here is showing us all the American states arranged by level of confidence here. Illinois is in 20th spot with the, these answers. They're, um, they look pretty good as I say, but they're states uh, down here where the proportion who say they're not confident and um, summing up they're, they're not confident, not at all confident. I could add they don't know that if I want, there aren't very many in Illinois. Um, it's even lower, but what stands out really is just there are only a couple of states where it's up here close to 20%. Uh, these are sort of high outliers where for one reason or another, people don't feel like they're, that they trust the election process to be run fairly smoothly, efficiently. They just don't have the confidence. If you compare the two panels, what's different here is this is not your own vote. It's, I think uh, all the votes cost across cast across your state, you feel confident that your state, that everybody's votes will be counted correctly. So right away, there's lower confidence. We, um, we still don't have very many people here often that I'm not at all confident, but far just a sliver under 5%. Uh, I'm not too confident, a little bit higher. I don't know, a little bit higher still. Um, mostly what we're seeing here is people who are saying, yeah, I'm somewhat confident, but they're, they're, they're not very confident. The state's handling their election, the, the votes correctly. And so the confidence is, um, maybe not surprisingly, uh, higher in, in this personal framing, if I, I'm thinking about my own ballot, most people uh, will say they're more confident their own vote was counted than they, and you know, that makes some sense. They have a direct experience of it. They, uh, maybe if they, most years, less, less this year, uh, are handed it in in person. They watch it get fed into a machine, so they feel like it's at least on its way towards processing and tabulation. Um, Illinois is a little bit, uh, I said it, we're 20th on, for people, voters' own confidence, we're a little um, better actually, around 16th, I think that is, in confidence across the whole state. But so those are not directly but fraud. But you could be confident your vote's counting or not confident because you're worried that you made a mistake personally or um, you're not confident. Confidence can be counted because you're casting your vote by mail and you're afraid it's gonna get lost on the way by the US Postal Service. It's not a fraud concern, it's an error concern. So um, I think it's an important question to ask and I think officials want to be, is what is it, many people in the dark green bar as possible, but it's not precisely fraud. Uh, but the same survey does have a set of questions about fraud. So let me look at those for a second. <clears throat> uh, the preface on these questions, there are six of them is, uh, here are some things that are illegal. How often do you think this takes place? And uh, the, there are six cues um, and that it's taking place in your own state. So people voting more than once people stealing or tampering with ballots that have been voted, people pretending to be someone else when going to vote. Those are the first three. In the middle here, I've got the Illinois answers, and then I've got the state that had the best answers and the state that had the worst answers, uh, best and worst in terms of belief perceptions of fraud, best is the lowest perception, worst is the highest perception. And it's a little bit hard to read probably, but off on the side here, just a tiny bit bigger. Um, I have the, uh, sorry, the, um, distribution of where, where is Illinois falling across the country and which states are doing, uh, what does it mean to be doing really well? So in this case, people voting more than once. In Illinois, um, the red, which has got the abbreviation C, is people saying that that's common. 
Orange is, it happens occasionally. The yellow is, it happens infrequently. The green is, it's not at all common. And then the gray is, I don't know. It's not clear that the gray answer is the best news. And from an election administration point of view, we'd like to think that uh, people regard this as something that happens not at all commonly. So that's why I've marked that in green. Uh, and just taking a look at Vermont, it's more than 60%. You think that that's something that's not at all common in Vermont. Illinois, it's more like 40%. South Carolina, the worst uh, score on, on this particular metric, it's down to about 30%. A lot more people think that that's a common occurrence in South Carolina. Uh, stealing or tampering with ballots have been voted. Same kind of story. South Carolina, again, is in last place. Uh, you could just north to North Carolina for the third one, pretending to be someone else, impersonating another voter. Again, Vermont is, uh, Wyoming was best on the second item. Vermont is, again, the state with the best. Uh, and this is entirely subjective. It doesn't mean that this, uh, this kind of illegal behavior doesn't happen in Vermont, but people don't think it happens there. Um, and Illinois, we're 13th. This is actually, uh, I think, the best finish for Illinois on these six items. The other six bring us to the one that is going to emphasize somewhat today. So people voting who are not US citizens, that's not the one that we emphasize. Uh, Vermont, again, is best. Arizona has uh, almost a uniform distribution. There are about as many people who think that's very common as think it's not at all common. Um, but people voting an absentee ballot intended for another person. Illinois has, uh, has finished as 29th on that. California has the worst set of answers. Uh, again, it's almost uniform. Almost as many people saying it's common as occasional, as infrequent, as not common, and then I don't know. And then officials changing the reported vote count. So those happen to be the six questions that uh, the designers of this survey from, I think these questions have been on the, there since the original designs. So they're uh, mostly from scholars at MIT and, and Caltech have given us a time series for. We can check eight against 12 against 16, soon one over 20, um, to see whether the, there's more or less belief in the fraud, there's more or less confidence in voting count, <clears throat> votes counting. One of the bits of good news is, uh, um, if you look across all these items and compare the 2016 to 2012 election as uh, surprising and in some respect controversial as 16 was, um, <clears throat> the beliefs in fraud mostly fell. Uh, so, and confidence mostly rose. By and large, American voters felt more confident that things had been run correctly and that there were fewer illegal activities in six, 2016 than they did in 2012. Um, from my point of view, sort of asking, what's, what does it look like on the ground in Illinois? Uh, we're in the middle most of the way here. Never in the top 10, never in the bottom 10. All of these answers are inherently ambiguous. So if you said people voting an absentee ballot intended for another person, that's not something we'd like to see happening. Uh, something like 7% think that's very common. What is very common? Well, you know, with a lot of survey research, it's whatever the respondent thinks. We didn't, they didn't try to say it happens it's 10% of all absentee ballots, it's 15% or it's 30%. Uh, you could ask questions that are designed to give you a much sharper uh, the kind of answer that maybe a court would like in litigation. But um, it's, it's, as I say, inherently subjective. So you, I think you could say, well, we'd, we'd at least like to know that it's coming down over time. If you're within a state and you're looking at, at these six items, you know, which one is the one that is the worst for us where the people are most concerned about the fraud or they, they think it's most widespread, which one should we try to address with different institutions? And, um, Going back to absentee voting, yeah, then uh, one of the things that's a little bit ambiguous about this, you, if you're in a Californian and thinking, uh, well, why do people think it's so common? The wording here, <clears throat> people voting an absentee ballot intended for another person, if you say it's very common, in one respect, in California, voting an absentee ballot is very common, much more common than it has been in Illinois and in uh, most of the other states, excluding Oregon and Washington, and I guess in 2016, Colorado, uh, states that have shifted to an entirely vote by mail or absentee system. But it's, it's, uh, it's possible the person could say, I think that's very common because they think, well, it's just because absence of voting is common. Uh, so if I'm really trying to interrogate these data to figure out, do people in this state believe that absence of voting is particularly vulnerable to fraud? I might want to compare this item E, that people uh, impersonating somebody else with an absentee vote to um, what I had labeled here, uh, C, people pretending to be someone else when going to vote. Say, so do people think absentee voting is, um, more prone to this kind of impersonation fraud than in-person voting. So I won't show you the analysis, but in, in one of the papers uh, I've done on this, using these same data, um, the answer, well, one answer to this question, you might think maybe, maybe people are suspicious of absentee voting where it's not used very often. 
And uh, until this year, Illinois was a place where it's been, although seeing more use, it's not terribly common, um, but where it's tried and true, Oregon and Washington switched to an entirely mail system. Um, California, Iowa, other states have a lot of absentee voting, maybe they trust it. Um, that doesn't turn out to be true. The, the difference between people's beliefs about in-person impersonation and absentee impersonation are, um, if anything, a little greater in places where there's more absentee voting. So if, if you were thinking, I like remote absentee mail voting, I think it's probably secure and safe. Um, and I bet you people are suspicious of it only because they just don't, haven't experienced it. Um, that doesn't really show up in the data. People are suspicious of it, even where it's more common. Uh, now, are they deeply worryingly suspicious of it? Again, it's a little bit hard to say. These are uh, also inherently ambiguous answers. It's common, it's occasional, it's infrequent. Different people will give a different meaning to uh, interpretation of what it means to say it's common. I think we'd like to say that <clears throat> all of these things are behaviors we, that we hope are not common and that if you're managing an election, you'd want to be setting rules uh, that will make it uh, not just hard to do, but make people believe that it's hard to do. Um, but I'm not at the moment trying to say, uh, the standard for excellence here is um, everybody should be in the green bar. In Vermont, which is Wyoming and Vermont, I think always are the state with the, the best uh, data in these metrics. And they still have people who think it's not that uncommon for uh, people to be engaging in some kind of fraud, one of these six behaviors. A second point to make with these is they're not mutually exclusive. So if I said, let's think about every way that uh, somebody can commit fraud in, in an election, some of these answers might overlap. So you might think, well, what really concerns me is people voting more than once. And I bet you people vote more than once by voting in person once and voting absentee once. And uh, the election um, within a state is, is designed to prevent that. So that shouldn't be incredibly easy to do, but people can be registered with different names or registered more than one place. And if people are registered across different states, um, it's actually probably easier. This is not my advice on how to commit voting fraud, but um, American elections are very decentralized. Federalism is, is the the first rule about how elections are run, the states do their own things. The counties within states tend to do different things or different voting systems in place. There'll be different implementation even of a state level law. Um, so there's really nothing like a national audit to make sure people aren't voting in different states, having registered in different states. Um, so I could think, I'm gonna say that uh, I think people are voting more than once and I think they're impersonating someone else with an absentee ballot or I don't think they're impersonating someone else. I think they're what they're doing illegally is voting more than once, but using absence of voting. So I wouldn't say these six questions are the universe of, of information about, um, or they cover the universe of kinds of fraud. They're just the ones that are handy. And if I was thinking about all the ways that are to cheat, there, um, there are many more. Um, let me just say one thing I forgot to say about why, why would I, if I'm really strongly interested in trying to figure out how much fraud takes place, why would I want to use survey data? Um, <laughs> There's a furious debate ongoing. It's not brand new to this election. It's probably louder than maybe noisier this election. It's become uh, polarized in partisan terms in a way that I don't think is, would have to have been the case. It's not automatic, but at the moment, um, by and large, you'll hear Democrats saying, uh, there's very little voting fraud. It's, it's a mirage. It's something Republicans talk about so that they can make it harder to vote and suppress the vote. And you hear Republicans saying it's rampant. It's uh, American elections are becoming less and less fair and they're getting rigged because Democrats are making it so easy to cheat and they're doing it on purpose. And um, the result is, of course, people don't believe the elections are fair because they're not. And so I would quickly say, I think, that, and those are caricatures of partisan sides. Of course, not all Republicans or all Democrats say either of those things. I think both of the claims I just mouthed are, are highly exaggerated. Uh, there isn't really good evidence that fraud is rampant or extreme or um, determining a lot of elections. On the other hand, there's also really, uh, I think it's very hard to make the case that there's no fraud at all or that remote and absentee voting are not somehow more prone to voting than to fraud. Um, so on the, on the second point, um, there are select cases. The North Carolina 2018 
ninth U.S. House District, um, after the election, the, the apparent winner was not actually seated. There were lots of allegations of vote fraud that um, didn't, weren't exclusively, but were mostly about absentee ballots. And the State Board of Elections investigated and they had hearings and they quickly decided there was good evidence that absentee voting had been abused. And so they uh, ordered a re, uh, rerun of the election. And that's just the most high profile and recent case where a court decided the evidence for absentee vote fraud was strong enough to vacate a result. Uh, it's not the only one. So it'd be hard to say there's no fraud at all or that nobody ever abuses absentee uh, voting. Why absentee in particular? Um, as I say, you can, and people believe that there are people pretending someone else from going to vote in person out right here, but it's surely easier to impersonate someone else or to vote multiple times if you're not doing it in person. And uh, I'm reminded one of my former colleagues, um, the first time he voted, I don't know why he was, he was in a performance. He was in a, in a drama club or something and they were doing a play that day. And he had to go straight from voting to the play or to a dress rehearsal. So he, he voted with a, uh, a beard, a fake beard glued to his face and was terrified someone was gonna say, how many times did you vote without the beard? And uh, you, know, you can, we can, uh, we could recycle uh, sort of documented cases of fraud of different kinds. But the interesting thing about absentee voting, it's, it's an innovation that's, um, really took off, uh, it's been a while now, I mean, for decades it's been growing in the United States. But when it, <clears throat> when it uh, was brought in in the big ways, sort of late 70s, early 80s, uh, the goal that the states that were early movers in this and said we can let people vote absentee without an excuse, prior to that it had been essentially a, a mechanism only for soldiers stationed outside their state uh, or um, people who were homebound or incarcerated or something like that. No excuse absentee voting was brought in um, basically to make voting more convenient on the promise that it would increase turnout. And there wasn't that much discussion of the fact that it, it did away with the secret ballot. The secret ballot was an innovation from about 100 years earlier, the late 19th century, that was very much expressly designed to prevent coercion of voters and fraud that were pretty common. Historians have a debate about just how common, but they were, uh, the debate is sort of, was it rampant or was it just prevalent, that nobody thinks there was no fraud in the 19th century. Uh, before the secret ballot, in fact, ballots often were colored. Uh, so the, there wasn't this a single uniform state printed ballot. People could tell how you voted because you were carrying a green or a red or a blue piece of paper to the uh, polling station and they could observe you and think, oh, he's got a green ballot. That's the way he's supposed to be voting. So the secret ballot was, I think, a landmark um, moment in American democracy. And then we kind of undid it. Uh, now, absentee ballot could be secret, but it's not inherently secret. Um, and I'll interrupt myself for this small digression that uh, you could say, well, voting, at, voting in the privacy of a booth in a polling station is no longer inherently secret either because nearly everybody carries around a camera. If I want to document how I voted, if I'm going to sell my vote, just bring my camera with me, take a picture of the ballot so I can at least prove that I filled it out correctly and then I walked out of the polling station without the ballot, I probably deposited it. So I could, I can violate the secrecy of the, of the polling booth too. And that's um, a, a pretty specialized topic, but a topic of its own with some states having put in rules against taking selfies. Uh, they're hard to enforce, not all states have done it. Um, taking so selfies in a, in a voting booth that is. But I, you know, I think it's easy to say still, the, the voting booth has a secrecy to it, a design that's supposed to ensure secrecy that remote voting, and I've been calling it absentee mail and remote interchangeably because states use those terms differently. So all I have in mind is uh, any system that lets you take the ballot, get the ballot mailed to you or take it away, fill it out wherever you want to at the timing that you like and send it back. Um, secrecy can be, you can write into the law that it's, it should be filled out secretly, but that's completely unenforceable. So whether it's secret or not is basically up to the voter. And that's a big shift. And I think it would be, even though proponents of, of remote voting or absentee voting like to say it's completely secure, there's no reason to think it's less secure. Uh, I think it's very clear that it's less secure by design, um, but it is not clear that it's led to rampant abuses and, and fraud. I think uh, on, the, on the contrary, I think it's safe to say we don't know the actual levels of, of fraud, but they're probably uh, low and marginal rather than rampant high and uh, poisoning American democracy. Okay, so um, I'm showing you survey data. Why don't I just show you, why don't I just talk through all the cases? I just said there was one in North Carolina. Um, 
I could talk about others, but uh, I think the most people would also probably agree that um, finding all the ca cases where someone was sanctioned for some kind of fraudulent behavior is going to give us a serious undercount of the level of fraud. And by analogy here, I like to talk about academic cheating. There's a giant literature on academic cheating, sociologists, education scholars, some, some little bit of political science, um, business schools have their own uh, sort of special interest in it. And most of that work is not based on um, documented cases, finding out how many students were expelled or suspended at each university, you know, which universities have the bigger problems. Uh, it's very heavily based on survey data. And the, I think the running assumption, the maintained hypothesis is you can learn a lot about how much uh, of a behavior that's in some respects, uh, it's not necessarily illegal, but dishonest, uh, against rules, um, shameful, socially undesirable. Even, even with all that, you can just ask people, have you ever cheated? Or ask them, how, how much do you think your peers cheat? You tend to get a higher level with the second question. Um, even the first question, have you ever cheated? You get remarkably high self-reports. So the large, large literature in academic dishonesty is pretty strongly based on survey data. And I think um, the election literature hasn't, uh, you know, I'm showing you one of the few surveys that's got a, that's gone up for multiple years with multiple questions, but it, we haven't done as good a job as trying to figure out if we can kind of align the uh, self-reports, reports of beliefs, and these kinds of, you know, these questions aren't, do you know anybody who's done this? Just how common do you think it is? With uh, um, harder to get and, and less systematically uh, collected incidences, uh, you know, incidence reports of actual fraud and court cases where an election is overturned. So if you're hoping I was gonna say today, it's extremely low, we all know that. Um, don't be fooled by the inflammatory rhetoric you hear all around you. That's not particularly in my line. I think uh, the rhetoric about rampant fraud is certainly an exaggeration. Um, but I also think the rhetoric from everybody who says voting at home is utterly safe, we know there isn't fraud, is an exaggeration in the other direction. And the, um, the truth for the moment is we don't know how much fraud it is, but I think it's useful to ask this kind of question, look at these data, and then from the point of view of election administration planning elections, uh, officials have a good reason to be putting in measures that are reassuring. So if we're having a debate about whether there need to be signature requirements and someone says it's too onerous, it just leads to the needless rejection of ballots. Um, we've got to make it easier to vote so more people vote. Someone else says, no, I think we have to have signature requirements. Otherwise, there's just no way to be sure the absentee ballots are really cast by the voters who are supposed to be casting them. I think data like this that show the people in a given state uh, you know, some proportion of them, maybe 25%, I think it's pretty common for absentee impersonation is good evidence on the side of the, of, there ought to be signature requirements of the, uh, that side of the debate. So that's about 30 minutes. I can talk on and on, um, but as you can see, I'm not leading towards a, a policy recommendation as such. I just said, I think officials should take into account public opinion. Um, if I, I could say now, and as a political scientist, I have the perfect statistical model of beliefs. I've looked at all these data carefully enough. I can tell you exactly what makes people more confident, less confident, and this is the set of institutions we need, but I don't have that. Uh, the, the data have some important and interesting patterns to them, but um, I would not say that, that uh, I know of anybody at this point who's produced an analysis of these data or similar data that would let me say, the optimal elect election system then is one that has uh, IDs for in-person voting, signature requirements and notary requirements for FTT voting, same day registration, blah, 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 blah. Um, we're still a long way from uh, anything like a persuasive model that says we have enough you know, data, enough variance across the states to know what makes people confident. Obviously, what, what's making people say these things happen or, or not happen in their state is a mixture of their own uh, their experiences, their secondhand reports, their thirdhand reports, uh, and if some of it is there's a lot of heated rhetoric going around of, of people claiming that elections are unfair and, and uh, rigged, um, it might just be the consumption of that rhetoric that's driving this and it's not anything to do with real behavior. That's not something I could just rule out. Uh, in a really careful analysis, we try to sort of separate as much as possible the effect of uh, reading about 
claims of fraud from any more direct experience, but um, it's more of a research agenda than a result. So I, I hope it's not hopelessly disappointing if I say um, I'm, I'm more, more or less saying this is a kind of information I think should be used by state uh, people planning election administration, but I don't end up with a, a conclusion of the forum. Um, there, should no, there should not be more mail voting or yes, the state should shift to exclusively to using mail voting. Uh, I think there's a good case to be made on both sides, but people should be thinking, at least thinking hard about beliefs about fraud and not settling for the glib. We know absentee votes are fraudulent or we know they're not. So I'm eager to have questions of all kinds. So let me stop for a second and see if uh, there are questions from Michelle from the Minnesota by chat, or I could carry on a little more and if, um, on select topics. Yeah, so um, I would encourage our attendees to use the Q&A feature um, and ask your questions there. Um, in the meantime, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, so, so this, this data is from 2016, which is obviously pre-COVID. Um, can, can you say a word about like the impact of um, both the pandemic and the partisanship that's come with that um, and its impact on how people are thinking about fraudulent voting? Yeah, so I should say um, pretty much every state in the country has changed procedures from 2016. And uh, when I wrote a paper with uh, Barry Burden at nearest Wisconsin for the Presidential Commission on Election Administration in, I think it was 2015, but it was before the 2016 election, we had said states that want more convenient voting should prioritize early voting, that absentee voting has more laws than early voting. So the, the distinction again, early voting is just voting in an official polling station in the privacy of the booth, but um, some period before election day. Illinois put, made early voting uh, the easiest kind of convenience voting before it, uh, it basically got no excuse absentee voting. So early voting has been more popular in Illinois in the last uh, roughly 20 years since they've both been taking off these convenient me convenience mechanisms. So um, Barry Burton and I said, uh, for better or for worse, we think early voting is a better way to have convenient voting states. Lots of states have already gone down the vote by mail path, they're not gonna turn back, but other states that, that haven't really made it easier to vote either these ways should think more about early voting. So I have to say now, we did not think about pandemics. Uh, there's not a word in our paper about what if people are afraid to go get in line, uh, whether it's on election day or early voting, they don't wanna touch the same equipment other people have been touching because they're worried about a deadly virus. <clears throat> so if I had, for rewriting that paper, I would say, okay, there are special circumstances and emergency circumstances. There are good reasons to make people, ask people to vote by mail, whatever the costs. And, and some of the costs we emphasized, I should say this again too, it, are, it's not strictly about fraud, but they're there for error costs that uh, the best estimates are that if you try to vote by mail, your ballot is much more likely to get lost. Um, it's a small probability. I, I should say much more likely than if you vote in person, it's very unlikely either way. Most of the time when you try to vote, it gets your vote is delivered and, and these people who say they're very confident their vote is counting up here, the uh, figure I showed about confidence that um, the best objective data is that people are right. They're, by and large, whether you're voting in person or uh, by mail, your most vote ballots show up. But uh, more of them do get lost if, they're, if there are more steps in the chain. Um, if, they, if you have to request the ballot and it has to be mailed to you and then you mail it back, um, it's more likely that one way or another something's gonna go wrong. Uh, so, we didn't think about the pandemic and um, as I say, almost every state has made it easier to vote remotely this year. And so one thing that means is, um, and this is a little bit different from the topic of vote fraud and vote confidence, but uh, all the discussion we're hearing of turnout right now is very speculative. I think this is gonna be the hardest election to forecast turnout for. So we know there's a really, really big surge in early voting. There's more early voting now than there was in 2016 and there's still a few days left of it. Uh, is that going to be people who wouldn't have voted otherwise or is it just moving the timing of the vote? So most of those are people who would have voted election day or they would have voted uh, in person early and now they voted in per by mail early. Um, we'll ultimately be able to do a pretty good accounting of that, but at the moment we're still guessing. So if you've probably seen the paper saying this is going to be the highest turnout since 1908, uh, it might be, but it might also just be about kind of average election 
because people making those forecasts are guessing that the in-person vote on election day will be about, about usual and the early vote will be way up. But as I think at least as likely that the early vote will be way up and the in-person vote will be down. Uh, so, uh, you know, I should say whatever else uh, in terms of the costs and benefits, I'm talking about people's sense of, of whether it's secure or objectively whether ballots are likely to get lost through error, um, that when there's another major cost out of the blue that people are just afraid of congregating, being crowds using public equipment that might not be cleaned properly, it makes very good sense for every state to be trying to make it easier to vote uh, without secrecy. So I, I, for all I said about the remote voting dispenses of secrecy, it's a shame to do that, at least, especially not even acknowledging it. Um, th this is clearly a weird election where uh, the value of secrecy probably um, shouldn't be overstressed as against the simple public health. Uh, I, I'll say one more thing. I don't want to, again, go too long. There are other topics we want to talk about, but um, the way the primary, the primary is kind of give us a dress rehearsal for uh, what happens if people are, are very nervous about getting sick and don't want to vote. Um, so Illinois went just before the pandemic outbreak with our primary timing and didn't have much of an impact. Wisconsin was sort of the, the test state, which did not delay. A lot of states delayed, postponed their primary so they'd have time uh, to shift to an all-mail system or uh, at least to try to um, plan around how to do in-person voting with uh, more remote uh, stations and so on. But Wisconsin just went ahead and did it. And <clears throat> there was a lot of press reporting about was chaos it was. There weren't enough in-person stations. So there were long lines and uh, Places didn't have enough mail ballots to supply all the requests they got, so people didn't get to vote. In the end, the turnout was about normal. Uh, I don't want to be glib about whether some people who tried to vote couldn't. That's always a terrible thing. But uh, there also wasn't very strong evidence of a spike in cases. There are three or four scientific papers out, competing papers, saying there was no spike, there was a spike. Um, the papers that say there was a spike are uh, essentially finding that there was more of a spike in cases where there was more remote voting, but at a point when the trends, the, the, the state's trend was downward. So at least the, the sort of simplest good news about Wisconsin was for all that it was kind of a shambles. Uh, it doesn't look like a lot of people got sick because they were exercising their democratic rights. And um, it didn't even look like uh, there were close results that were the result were determined by uh, sort of mistakes pandemic induced mistakes in election administration. Yeah, thank you for, um, for saying more about that. We have two questions um, and three now. Um, so the first one is, have there, have there been any studies that compare actual fraud as opposed to how often people think it happens in states where they have universal mail-in voting versus states where they don't? Uh, there has, I think the, um, the quick conclusion would be there's, uh, there are few enough cases that have gone, uh, have sort of met the jurisprudential standards for establishing fraud so that a court has said, uh, there's definitely fraud here, we're throwing the result out, ordering a new election, that it's, it's pretty hard to make it, to reach a strong conclusion that, that fraud is more prevalent here and less prevalent there. I think most, I'm probably unusual as a political scientist in the degree to which I say we don't know, as opposed to we know that there's hardly any fraud. I think more political scientists than me would say <clears throat> it's very rare. I think it's somewhat rare, but we don't know how much takes place. And, and then, so I tend to emphasize that when cases arise, sometimes it, they sort of arise incidentally. Uh, so occasionally people get prosecuted for voting as, as non-citizens not because someone went looking to try to figure out, make sure all the votes were cast by citizens, but because the person in question was picked up for some other crime. And then in the course of uh, making a case, they discover that this is a person who also voted as a, committed the felony of voting without being a citizen. Um, so I tend to go back to the problem that we don't have uh, a thorough audit. If Warren Buffett and Bill Gates said, we're just gonna throw $10 billion at a commission that can do the, uh, the best possible audit for every port, every kind of fraud to take place. Um, I would welcome the money. I'd be happy to be part of the team spending it, but there isn't any such thing. So the auditing that takes place to determine how much different kinds of cheating is, is almost always selective. And um, you know, there, there are sort of anecdotes everywhere 
uh, I'll take one um, particular case. Washington is one of the all vote by mail states. And if you read the uh, official documents the Secretary of State puts out that describe the history of, of the voting system in Washington, they say one of the reasons we switched to all vote by mail was because of the chaos of the 2006 gubernatorial election. So that was an election that was exceptionally close that appeared to have been won by the Republican candidate, Dino Rossi, um, but by hundreds of votes. So they did a recount and he was still up, but by a smaller margin. And then it was possible to have a, a hand recount, but only if the party that wanted it paid for it. The Democrats got the money. I think they actually got money from a teacher's union um, and then paid for it. And in the, th the third recount, they found enough votes that the Democrat, Christine Gregoire won. And the Republicans were irate and felt that they'd been, the election had been stolen, they'd been robbed. And um, one of the things that happened in the recounts, and of course the, for the recounts was there was a lengthy dispute about uh, signature matching on absentee ballots. And one of the, I think it was a Democratic party official, but an official somewhere discovered his ballot had been rejected and he was surprised. And then they tried to figure out what the rejection criteria were. And um, the, one of the reasons I think in the end that it was a, basically the winner at that election was gonna be determined by the, who had the better election players rather than who got the most votes because it was too hard to know with such a close result who really got the most votes. Um, but it was a, the, the, it was, there was no question there were some differences across the counties in the way uh, the ballot authentication and ballot rejection rules were implemented. And then they, they found new ballots that had been left out of the count in the court and, and those were in a heavily democratic county. So um, there's always noise in an election and unless it's really close, we don't notice it. And then in Florida in 2000, this Washington gubernatorial's race when it's really, really close, we realize there's no such thing as a perfect system. There's lots of different kinds of noise involved. And um, when it's uh, laid out, then the losers end up really, uh, really upset that it was grossly unfair. Um, the, the striking thing about that is that Washington then said, well, to fix this, we'll go to an all vote by mail system, even though vote by mail signatures were kind of critical in the, this messy resolution that meant that there were ballots that maybe could be counted, maybe shouldn't be counted. And the ruling that came down was the one that helped the Democrats say, yeah, they should be counted. Um, but I, I think it's kind of ironic that Washington now would say uh, that election taught us that we should switch to an all vote by mail system if it, one of the critical issues was establishing identities of voters, which is harder to do with a, a remote vote than it is with an in-person vote. Um, so our next question is for Mark, and he's asking, um, there are arguments that voter ID laws play a role in preventing fraud. However, others believe that they only serve to increase disenfranchisement of voters. Is there similar data surrounding voter confidence in, in regards to these laws? Um, do states that have an enacted voter ID system see an increase in confidence, or is the, the idea that such laws increase voter disenfranchisement leave people less confident? Uh, so that one's easier to answer. I think the, the um, trajectory in this has been their voter ID laws are popular. So again, it has turned into a partisan, a pretty, pretty much aligned in partisan politics where you wouldn't necessarily think it has to. But Democrats tend to say ID laws are unfair. They suppress the vote. Republicans tend to say they're necessary. They prevent fraud. Um, on this one, the Republican position, it's not inherently a Republican position, but the position that IDs are a good idea is... Um, in almost all surveys strongly support it. The people who don't oppose it, who don't like it, tend to be uh, strong Democrats. So they've sort of got the, the talking points from the party, the, the party line that it's a, it's a requirement it might be onerous for some voters and it's reducing turnout. But, um, and the, I say the public almost always, so it, we'll do an independence thing, independents like it. Um, the, uh, the gap has come down a little bit over the years. So more people maybe have heard the democratic line and, and decided to be persuaded that ID requirements aren't so fair. But the, as far as I, the last time I've looked at this, um, if you just ask, do you think that this is a good idea, the public likes it. Uh, and it, that one's positively correlated with confidence. It's not, a, it's not the sole determinant at all. And I could um, probably two, two political scientists on opposite sides of a court case could come up with regression models with different sets of controls so that one of them says it is helping confidence. They would say, no, it isn't. Um, but in a simple bivariate case where there are ID laws, there's, uh, there's a little bit more confidence that people aren't impersonation, aren't impersonating someone else to vote. That makes sense. 
Um, so we have another question. In your opinion, would it boost confidence in the integrity of voting if public officials who administer voting were more transparent about how they validate ballot ballots, how they verify identity, how they prevent voting twice and voting for someone else, et cetera? Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, I said a few times now, there's, there's a pretty polarized uh, debate where Republicans fall on one side, Democrats the other. I think that you can kind of some, get some win-win solutions if everybody can agree that you know, what we really need is transparency. Um, one of the problems with transparency is it can be costly. I said transparency with a really close result also shows all the warts and makes people think, um, now, we have to, now we're worried about ballot design. Now we're worried about uh, this very small number of people who cast federal only ballots. Those turned out to matter. Maybe the clerks who are uh, or the manning the stations don't know, uh, don't implement the rules on who gets a federal only ballot the same way. And that's gonna, this tiny little feature in the election will be critical. But um, the, the more, first of all, that the rules can be well known in advance, uh, the better. I think the 2000, 2016 election served as a, a sort of civics lesson on the electoral college so that, um, it, it, I don't wanna sound like I'm criticizing the Amer American public for not understanding the electoral college because I think the funny thing with presidential elections is the electoral college is, is almost invisible in the background. And if you're just kind of interested in politics, nobody says I'm voting for the electors who are going to support Joe Biden. They say, I'm voting for Biden, I'm voting for Trump. We talk as though we're voting directly for candidates. Um, but in fact, we have this complicated system that has an indirect mechanism where you vote for electors who later then will vote for those candidates. So um, in 2000, when Al Gore won the popular vote and didn't win the presidency, it had been, it, the last time that it happened was 1960. And uh, even then it wasn't understood, widely understood that that was true of Kennedy, that he'd lost the popular vote. So people sort of got a reminder on how the electoral college works. And they got another reminder in 2016, if you're angry about it, there's a reform underway to try to have national plurality elections. But uh, I think the, the more that the rules can be very clear and then all of the um, really tough decisions that arise, like what do you do with uh, postmarks that can't be, you've got a postmark deadline and you can't read the postmark. At least we should be clear that uh, it would be nice to know that Across the state, the same decision is being implemented if the postmark is unclear and the law says the, the ballot has to have a postmark by election day to be counted. We'd like to think everybody does the same thing with the unclear ones. Um, and uh, I think it's true that uh, the internet, which in some respects is the friend of democracy, it makes it easier to get information. In some respects, it's the enemy because it's also easy to get disinformation. It does make it easier for election administrators to be to put more information where it's accessible to the public. And people who don't wanna know a thing about provisional ballots because it's nitty gritty and they don't like politics that much don't have to know. But it's, I think it's, we're moving towards this direction where it's easier for election officials to um, improve confidence by being as transparent as they possibly can about all the, the very small decisions that usually don't matter because an election's not close enough. But in a really close election, a lot of these uh, sort of minutia do turn out to matter. I, I can't help but ask this um, mostly because I, I just was listening to a podcast about how there used to be um, nonpartisan or sorry, bipartisan um, support of eliminating the electoral college. I know like Nixon was behind that um, even when he like even when it did serve him. Um, do you see a future where the electoral college is not a part of um, our electoral system. Do you ever see plurality? So I, I have published a paper saying no, um, but there, there's a scheme underway. The National Popular Vote uh, Interstate Compact um, is a, an attempt to have a most votes win standard for presidency without amending the constitution. It's really hard to amend the constitution in more than 200 years. It's happened 27 times. The last one was James Madison's payroll, pay raise amendment and it took uh, almost 200 years to pass. So if I thought the only way we'd ever have most votes wins for presidency is amending the constitution, I'd say that's not gonna happen. Um, the interstate compact is a very clever idea. Uh, essentially the idea is that the states don't have to award their electors to whoever wins the state. They can award their electors to whoever wins the national vote. And uh, a lot of states have signed on. Illinois is one of them, one of the earlier movers. Um, 
However, this also has turned out to be a very polarized thing. Democrats love it, Republicans hate it. So it's, it's been passed only in states that had unified democratic government or that had strong enough democratic legislatures that they could override a Republican veto. So even in a, a tsunami, suppose the, um, the election a few days away, uh, Joe Biden wins and Democrats do really well in state houses and they, they uh, collect a lot more state legislative seats. Um, I still think it's unlikely that you get enough states that have unified democratic government to pass the, get the, the national popular vote plan over the threshold. The threshold is 270 states that have 270 electoral votes because the whole idea is uh, it doesn't matter how many states agree to do this unless the group, the set of states that agree to do it have a majority so of the electors, it doesn't, what doesn't make sense. Once they have a majority, then it kicks in. Uh, I think it's not gonna pass in the near future or even the, the far future. Um, the proponents can take heart from the fact that no state that has joined yet has left. So it's so far a ratchet up, but we're still a long way from 270 and the Democrats have to do extremely well or Republicans have to decide they also like the idea of a national popular vote interstate compact. Even if enough states join it, it still has some pretty serious legal barriers that I think might slow it down. So I think we're, we've got the electoral college for better or for worse, there are pros and cons that we said for it, but for um, my lifetime, That's interesting. Um, Mark just sent a link to the podcast I was referring in the Q&A. Um, and I, yeah, it's um, it's the New York Times, the daily um, podcast, which I listen to pretty religiously. <laughs> um, so I would, I would, if anyone is interested in that, um, on the, in that perspective, um, it's found in any podcast app. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, so in the 2006, um, is that Goober national election? The gubernatorial race, yeah, the Washington one I was talking about with Rossi and Gregoire. Mm -hmm. Right, um, in the third recount, there were some ballots that were found to have been left out of the earlier counts. Um, how did those ballots get left out? How did that happen? Um, where was the breakdown in the safety mechanisms that were supposed to prevent that? So uh, I, you know, I, it's off the top of my head. My recollection was it was just um, the courts decided they would count them and they decided it was human error and it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a great explanation. It was something like somebody had in the course of transporting a ballot box from one place to another, left it in the trunk of his car or something. But it was, uh, my recollection is officials had violated rules accidentally. Um, now, some people would say not accidentally, this, they did this on purpose, or those ballots were filled out by Democratic precinct workers long after the election took place. And so lots of conspiracy theories. Um, they're hard to disprove. I, I think the, the broader point is uh, when there are really close races and there's a recount, like I said, we end up seeing all the warts in the system. Um, the elections are very complicated and we, there's enough error. Uh, we talk about margin of error in polls all the time. I think that there's margin of error when you're sampling in a survey, but in a census where you count everybody, there shouldn't be error. But in fact, we know the census does have some error. They try hard to get rid of it, but there's error in the census. In an election where you're just counting all the ballots are cast, there's still error. Um, and one of the sources of error, I think, again, uh, sometimes you'll hear someone from another country saying, oh, these Americans uh, can't run an election. Why can't they just run an election? Americans vote on a lot. American ballots are much more complicated than ballots in most other places. If you're voting in Britain or in Canada, in a general election, you go and vote, you make one choice. Who do I want to be my member of parliament? Pick from four or five names, you're done. Americans go to fill out their ballot and they have 25 choices. Uh, they have county offices and state offices, and local offices, they might have referenda, whether they should amend their constitution to get rid of the flat tax provision, uh, we vote on a lot of stuff, and that makes the process harder. Uh, the, the federalism I talked about, the fact that states have different rules and counties implement rules in different ways, that also makes uh, life harder. And I think there isn't any such thing as a perfect system that's error-free. So when you get a very close election, discover there were some errors, people make mistakes. And mistakes could be really the kind of minutiae I'm talking about where someone who shows up and can't prove that they're at the right precinct, do they get to vote at all, did they get a provisional ballot, did they get a ballot that has only federal races on it? Um, or they can be more uh, sort of comical in the, in the uh, 
Minnesota Senate recount that uh, Al Franken and uh, Norm Coleman had another of these races decided by just dozens of votes. Um, they ended up having to decide what to do with ballots where somebody had drawn a cartoon along with picking, putting an X in a box, someone who's bored, a little bit frustrated with the election, uh, does a lot of sketching or something, and then maybe registers a choice, maybe doesn't register a choice. And I, I think ultimately those recounts in ultra close races are always won by the side that has the better election lawyers rather than by the candidate who we know had the stronger support amongst the voting public. And so I'd like to say that there's a way to avoid that, but I don't think there is. I think um, partly because of the complexity of American voting, but um, also just because we're talking about big scale events, there's some error in the process and that's unavoidable. And um, you have to kind of take it along with the, uh, the benefits of democracy that this is a small price. Thank you for that. Um... I, so we are pretty much at about time. I'm wondering if you have any closing thoughts, um, especially before Tuesday. Um, yeah, you know, in, in 2016, I was doing election night commentary and I was like everybody else saying, uh, you know, I, I, if Donald Trump is gonna win, he's gonna have to do this, this, and this, and this, and then he did it. And I was, you know, it wasn't that I said, and I think it's gonna happen. I was caught by surprise. Uh, and in 2000, like everybody else, I was caught by surprise by, for example, the butterfly ballot. Uh, we, I had been teaching elections class. I talked about ballot format, and then I, I, I could gloat about it to my students, saying, "I was talking about election, you know, ballot format two weeks ago, and you all thought it was boring. But now the whole country is talking about ballot format." So, um, in every election, to some extent, we end up with a new surprise. The 2016, in the end, one of the big stories was the pollsters had a bad model of who was going to vote, and in, not in every state, but in certain states, they had not. Uh, figured out that people, with, especially white voters without college degrees were uh, more enthusiastic than usual and they were gonna surge in voting and that meant they underestimated the Trump vote. So this time around, um, I think with this big surge in male voting, we're gonna see some wrinkles and mistakes that are relate to people casting remote votes ballots that they haven't, they haven't done before and they're not used to it. But I don't know very specifically what's gonna come up. It might be that in the next two weeks, I find myself talking to reporters over and over again about notarization requirements, which states have them and why they're in place. Um, and some feature like this, or maybe that, that won't be the story at all. It's gonna be something totally different. But I think, uh, yeah. uh, again, because of the, in, this is such a complicated event, getting so many people to register so many choices um, in so many different ways that uh, you should expect there to be some um, hangups. And maybe the other thing about it is where there's smoke, there's not always a fire. It, it, it isn't necessarily there's conspiracy, the elections are being stolen and rigged. It's just that they're complicated and there will be errors. And if we're a little bit more relaxed with the errors, that's probably better for uh, the happy resolution, even when there's a very close race and it's almost a coin toss who gets called the winner. Well, thank you for that. Um, I have learned a lot and I'm sure our attendees have. Um, and yeah, voting is complicated and um, yeah, definitely a cost in, in this democracy that we're in. Um, a line that I think it's attributed to Winston Churchill, democracy is the worst system except every other one. I think, uh, <laughs> for all the messiness of voting, I'm glad they have the chance to do it. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we're really grateful for this, for the, your time. Thank you, attendees. Um, and yeah, go out and vote. Um, early voting at the Y, election day um, is Tuesday. And so stay safe, everyone, and have a good weekend. Thank you very much.